firm are now in place, um, <laughs> uh, Mr. Thomas. So my, my lord, thank you. you. May proceed. I assure you that my infirmity is temporary. Glad to hear it, Roger. <laughs> well, if I might, I, I, I'm going to briefly summarise the position overall as we uh, see it, then deal very briefly with each limb of that, uh, and hopefully then draw to a conclusion. Uh, my lord, on the remaining issue, uh, the meaning particularly of the words in section 191, we say first that the judge was right for the reasons he gave and set out in the judgment to find that marina and its constituent elements fell within each of the terms landing places, jetties, stages, on the natural and ordinary meaning of those terms, and that therefore fell within the de definition of dock within section 191. Secondly, whilst uh, unlikely to affect the outcome of the appeal, we do submit that the judge was, if anything, a little bit too conservative in his approach to the language of the Act, and should also have found that marina and or its constituent part constituted the dock and or piers and or walls, all within the meaning of that same section. Thirdly, the appearance and wharves. Wharf. Piers uh, and wharves, my lord. As can well as wharf, the Can a wharf be floating? Can it be floating wharf? Well, when we see the definition in our submission, it could be, it can be, yes. I think it's a flexible definition, as, as indeed all of these terms are. It's not the sort of normal use of the word, is it? Um, my, my Lord, I, I accept it may not be the normal uh, use of the word, and we'll come to that, but we do submit it does. I mean, when you, um, when you sail or uh, go in one of those um, ta taxi boats, you know, whatever they're called, down the Thames, you see a lot of old wharves, and none of them is floating. Well, my Lord, we, we, we'll come to that if I may in due course. Okay, yeah. I mean, I'm just interested because there are a lot of things also that used to be in the Thames that were, were floating and had a ramp down to them. Um, what are they called? Well, the, 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 they could be landing places, stages, um, jetties. Piers. Jetties? Jetties. But there's not a name, though, because they were popular in London, in the London dock, weren't they? But look, uh, one of the points that I'll make sure launch is when we look at some of the definitions, they, there's definitely a very substantial crossover. So. Uh, we'll come to it, but I think a jetty is described as a small pier and so forth. So that none of these items in our submission are, if you like, um, exclusive. These terms can be used to the same. Uh, sorry, a number of these terms can be used to uh, to describe the same structure, and that's one of the uh, w one of the things I'll draw your your lordship's attention to, particularly in the context of something such as pier. It is, and all of them are flexible and broad terms in our submission. So if I'm, I make good that submission uh, shortly. Um, well, also the third uh, uh, point that we submitted, the appellant's grounds of appeal and their skeleton argument disclose no basis for overturning the findings made by the judge uh, and the orders he made as a consequence. On the contrary, the appeal essentially requires an exceptional limitation to be read into the unqualified and unambiguous language of the statute. Now, that uh, exceptional limitation has no identifiable legal basis or justification that the <coughs> appellants have been able to identify. Even now, it is undefined, or at best ill-defined, and uncertain in scope. And as best it is understood, it is difficult, if not impossible, to apply in practice. Is this the commercial, the commercial usage? My lord, the commercial usage, if that's how it is now put, then yes, it, it's broadly um, at that limitation albeit as, as I've submitted just now, it's unclear what what the limitation is or how it's delimited. Um, and we also submit that any such limitation or exception is inconsistent with the undisputed purpose of section 191, which was to provide a reciprocal right to limit the vessel owners and dock owners' liability alike. And that's a right of which your lordships will be aware on the vessel owning side at least uh, it's well established extends to leisure craft uh, and so any interpretation of the act in our submission uh, that leads to a lopsided result would be inconsistent with that purpose well, if I might then move on to the first uh, of those submissions namely that the judge was correct to find 
uh, that the elements, the marina and its elements, fell within three of the subparagraphs. The relevant provision, as all ships will know, is subsection 9 of section 191, and that defines a dock as including wet docks and basins, tidal docks and basins, rocks, cut entrances, and so forth, and importantly for our purposes, <coughs> walls, piers, stages, landing places, and jetties. Now, I make the uh, obvious point in opening, uh, my lords, to put the words we're focusing on in context. That definition includes elements which wouldn't naturally fall within the meaning of dock. You have in particular reference to cuts, entrances, and locks, none of which naturally fall within the meaning of a dock, whatever it is, and we'll come to that. But what it indicates, uh, and the context in our submission that's relevant, is that it is and was intended to be a broad definition. Mr. Justice Tier described this as being uh, <coughs> cast in very wide terms, and indeed that reflects Lord Justice Scrutton's uh, uh, observation in the City of Edinburgh at page one, sorry, page three three one of the authorities bundles, where he describes Parliament having used very wide words, uh, and that's, as I said, the context in which the words are, are to be. Seen and in our submission, of course, uh, that is uh, inconsistent with my learned friend's attempts to read down these words in the manner that he does. But turning then to the three grounds relied upon by the judge, um, he found uh, that the marina and its elements were landing places, jetties, and stages on the natural and ordinary meaning of those words, and in our submission, rightly so. Well, Lord, I'm going to look at those uh, briefly in turn, but just uh, to I'm sure I've covered all the ground and to reiterate I think what I said earlier, the new point made by my learned friend that there's a, a need for some connection to the land it is one that we don't respectfully, uh, respectfully submit, understand these elements were connected to the land it just happened to be by a bridge, it could have been by a gangway, it could have been by another pontoon. It just happened in this instance that they used uh, a form of bridge, which doubtless allowed the tide to rise uh, and fall. But that point in itself seems to us to be of absolutely no relevance to the definitions uh, which you have to consider at all. Turning then, my lords, briefly to the elements, and I, I deal with them in the order in which they appear in the statute. The first is stages. His, his lordship dealt with this at paragraph 43 on page 54 of the bundle uh, and the definition of uh, stages we can find in the authorities bundle at page 380 and it's a platform used as a gangway landing place to support or stand for materials uh, that's a simple term uh, with a broad meaning uh, and in our submission although Mr. Cooper sought in his skeleton to criticise the judge for finding that the relevant elements of marina fell within this and the other definitions without, to use his words, any real analysis. In our submission, it's hard to see how much more analysis is required than that which the judge actually applied. As he says in uh, paragraph 43, he quotes the definition. And he says, thus, just as the pontoons forming the marina may be described as landing places, so then would be fairly described as stages in the sense of a platform used as a landing place, notwithstanding they're also a mooring place. I also uh, adopt Lord Justice Stuart Smith's observation that gangway is also part of that definition. And as we saw the photograph uh, I took you to just before lunch of people uh, are walking up and down looking at the yachts, that is, in my submission, uh, a gangway on uh, any definition. I was struck by that picture, thinking... How many of those people had embarked or disembarked or landed there oh. um, uh, from the um, yachts? And uh, thinking, and maybe I shouldn't say this, but it is slightly unrealistic to say that it's a place where you berth, but not a place where you land. Well, we'll come to that, but in, in every, on every occasion where I've berthed a boat, I've also landed. Um, you berth to land. You may leave the vessel there on the berth, but you berth to land. That's the purpose almost entirely of berthing. Um, so 
Well, I mean, he would say, to be fair, he would say no. The purpose of berthing is to keep the vessel safe, and the marina is a safe haven for the the, the, the craft. But um, uh, I mean, I think at the very least he has to accept that people will land from the vessels when they berth there. Well, and on that note, I might move to landing places, which is where I think this uh, comes in. My lord, the definition of uh, or the term landing places in and of itself is a broad and generic term, that much is clear. And in our submission, it encompasses any places where goods or people are, are, are landed. Uh, and again, in my respectful submission, when one looks at the humorist and Mr. Justice Wilmer's approach, the common sense principles, uh, the judge was absolutely right in his judgment to find that this, uh, these elements constituted a, a landing place. In paragraph 35 of his judgment, he, he quotes the OED definition, uh, and then uh, Mr. Justice Wilmer, and he says the pontoons which make up the marine at Holyhead are places where owners of small leisure craft moor their craft. There are also places where those on board the small leisure craft, uh, when they return from sea to marina, step ashore or land. Uh, and as such, uh, they are uh, uh, therefore landing places. Submission. You say he was right. I do, my lord, yes. It's an adventurous submission. My lord, <laughs> I'd like to be bold in my submissions. Um, my, my lord, the attempt my learned friend made to distinguish uh, 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 the landing place um, from what might be regarded as the ordinary meaning of it, I think depends on the use in the Oxford English Dictionary of the term passengers as a place where passengers or goods can be landed or disembarked. That seems to be the nub of his case now. And of course, if you're crew or skipper, you might land, but you're not passengers landing. Now, in my respectful submission, uh, there's two answers to that. One, it is the sort of technical pettifogging that Professor Tettenborn uh, uh, considered the judge had rightly put pay to. Uh, it also in our submission may simply be that the OED definition is a little bit too narrow. Landing place, as the judge has found, is somewhere where you land. And why do we need <laughs> definition? I mean, landing place is, is a place where you land. I mean, well, it's obvious. And a skipper and crew still land, whether they're regarded as passengers or not. So It appears it, to be a term that's been used since the 16th century, or I think even maybe the 15th century. Exactly. Even in Shakespeare. My Lord, exactly. But I think my learned friend's case now revolves around looking and focusing on the use of passenger, the word passenger in the OED definition. Say, ah, therefore it's, re it, 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 it's defined or restricted by that. And I mean, definitions are a tool. They are not to be written as statute. They're not to be read as a statute just because the Oxford English Dictionary has a particular form of words. That is um, the collation of people's general wisdom. It's not... Um, a statutory definition. My, my lord, precisely, precisely the point, and uh, on, on that note, my lord, I, I don't think I need to say any more about that. What, what I will submit in relation to paragraph 35 is that the judge was also correct to dismiss the argument, which I think now my learned friend has described as the key factor, that because the vessels might moor, uh, that they are no longer or never were landing places. They ceased to be such or never were them. I'm not quite sure what, what his case is. But that question, that dual purpose, is, is expressly dealt with the judge <coughs> our submission entirely correctly. He said they're both mooring places <coughs> and landing places, and that's self-evidently correct. Uh, but the important thing is they don't <coughs> cease to be landing places just because they may also be used to moor the vessel. So the terminology can be landed is perhaps too narrow. It suggests something that is done to people and therefore perhaps brings in the idea of passengers who are passive, but actually it's a landing place where you land and that well, um, is an active choice. My Lord, it's just so. Uh, and the, the, the other point about this particular argument, uh, as we said, it only actually is relevant to landing places. Um, it said they're not landing places, they're mooring places. But that doesn't of course affect uh, the proper meaning to be given to jetty or, or indeed <coughs> any of the other provisions of the Act. It simply doesn't impinge on, on those, uh, the definitional meaning of those particular terms. 
it can only, if anything, neutralise mm. the landing place. But, but as I said, it doesn't cover jetties, for instance, and as we'll see shortly, the definition <coughs> of jetty includes places where boats are moored. So it doesn't um, uh, really assist my learned friend in any respect, even if you were with him on the landing place uh, question. And to, to brief subsidiary points on, on this particular uh, question, the, the attempt to um, suggest there's a dual purpose, one more dominant than the other. The judge actually made no findings in this respect. Um, but, but also, uh, and more importantly, it would create impossible dividing lines. It would be a distinction that would be almost impossible to uh, apply. It may be, for instance, uh, that um, many boats do stay moored for long periods of time. It may be that there is a, a small but active group of local sailors who go out every day, or three times a week, whatever it is. Now, it, it, the, the, di the distinction between a mooring place and a landing place requires one <coughs> to make a qualitative distinction. W when is it landing? When is it mooring? How many times a week? How many times a day? What, what, it's an impossible distinction to draw in practice. Uh, and indeed one which is, is plainly not contemplated by the Act. Uh, and again, you'll have seen, uh, my laws, that there's visitors' berths in, in Holyhead Marina. They're shown in some of the diagrams we saw. Now, how, how are they? <coughs> I mean, visitors' berths, by definition, are, are berths uh, where visitors stay, visiting yachts stay for a short period of time. Are they landing places or are they mooring places? Again, the, 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 the distinction my little friend seeks to draw is impossible to apply in practice and will lead to immeasurable problems. Now on the question of jetties, the judge did find that the relevant structures were jetties. The definition from uh, the dictionary uh, uh, has at least two relevant parts. If I could ask your lordship to turn up page 340. I think my learned friend took you to the definition of a breakwater pier, etc., constructed to defend the harbour, stretch of coast or river bank. But if you turn the page to 341, there is a simpler definition at the top a landing stage or small pier at which boats can dock or be moored. Uh, and my lord, again, um, in our submission, common sense principles that say that what you have in this case is plainly a jetty within that definition. Um, if a reality check is required, um, Mr. Spall, the applicant's own expert, refers to the finger berths on numerous occasions as finger jetties, um, and references there are supplementary bundle page 155, 163 and 166. We simply rely on that to show that as a matter of language and how people familiar with the industry use it, these were considered to be jetties. It simply supports the obvious proposition that on the definition of jetty, these were indeed uh, jetties. So well, those are the three points his lordship um, found uh, for in our favour. If I might then turn to our respondent's notice briefly, because we submit that he, he, he was a little bit timid and ought to have found that the uh, structures also constituted uh, docks, piers and wharves. Um, I'll deal with piers first, if I may, simply because the OED definition that we've just seen of jetty describes it as, amongst other things, a landing stage or small pier. And to Lord Justice Mayo's point about the overlap between these definitions. You could describe it as a jetty, you could describe it as a small pier. None of them are, are, are hermetically separated from the other. And in our submission, um, describing uh, something that is a jetty as a small pier indicates why the relevant elements of Hollyhead Marina also would constitute a pier in the ordinary meaning of that term. Well, my Lord, the, 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 the judges distinction, we can find at paragraph 41 of his judgment, and, and, and he felt that a pier, in ordinary usage, connotes a structure 
rather more substantial than the pontoons in Holyhead Harbour. I, I took the court earlier to, to quite how big these individual elements are. But, but in our submission, uh, there's nothing in the definition of a pier that requires it to be of any particular size or, or dimension. As you've just seen, a jetty is a subset, if you like, of something that might properly be described as a pier. But piers tend to be piled into the seabed, don't they? My, my Lord, they, they may. The definition says. My, my Lord, they, they may uh, or may not be. Um, in this instance, for instance, the, the definition is um, a landing stage in the sea or a river lake consisting of a platform. Thus far, I hope there's no dispute that we fall within that. And then it says supported on pillars and open beneath. The, the, the structures here were certainly open beneath. They floated on the water so the sea could pass under them. The only question really for, for your Lordship then would be whether you, you believe the definition of pier is restricted to something that is on pillars or, or whether something that is otherwise identical but is simply anchored to the seafloor in some other way uh, falls outside that definition. And our, our submission, that would be a, a semantic distinction to draw. But certainly the in, judge's view in was... In more general language, uh, if you talk about, for example, buildings on piers, you're talking about a fixed substructure drilled or piled piers. My Lord, that may, that may be correct. Um, I, I, I'm just really, I think, echoing what my Lord said. If I, if, and this may not be a very useful check, given we've already referred to the man on the strand. Mm. But if someone says pier to me, the first thing I think of is South End. South. And the second thing I think of is driving piers into the ground. My, my Lord, so be it. I, I would like, sorry, Lordship, that the, the definition is, is, is broader. I'd make two further submissions on, on that. First is that uh, it is relevant in my respectful submission to note that uh, my clients use the term peer to describe their uh, own structures. Uh, your Lordships will find that in their brochure at page 257 of the supplementary bundle. Uh, and also the environmental scoping report, which you'll find in the supplementary bundle, regularly describes these structures as peers, 189, uh, 199, 198 and so forth. So as a matter of language for, for those familiar with the industry, these certainly struck them as being uh, structures that could be described as peers as well as, as other things. Uh, and a necessary part of that. But you don't need it, do you? We, we don't, my Lord, absolutely not. We, we don't need it. Um, I, I would, however, uh, then finally, uh, and at the risk of testing your Lordship's patience, Note that in the Craig Hall at tab 19, a floating, a floating landing stage was described by various of the judges as a pier. Well, that illustrates the point, doesn't it? Because then it's a landing stage. I mean, I, are there any circumstances in which this marina could be a pier without also being at least one of the other things? And if the answer to that is no, then at this point, my Lord, I, I accept I did open by saying we, we, we don't anticipate it'll make a difference, but um, uh, part of our respondents' notice, and if your Lordships are not assisted, I'll, I'll, I'll move on. Uh, th these structures very much overlap. It's hard to see how a stage wouldn't be a landing place or a landing place wouldn't be a stage on the definition, or indeed why all of them wouldn't be a jetty as well. I mean, that's, that just illustrates the point about the breadth of this definition. Intended to be a broad definition. I mean, it does seem there's a lack of precision in the use of these various different words, but that uh, also adds to your case. My Lord, it does. It does. Uh, on that note, my Lord, I, I will move on then to briefly address uh, the other two parts of our uh, on this notice. The first is, is wharf. I've already felt your Lordship's reticence. I, I will simply submit as follows, it is that the Harbours Act 1964, which we'll find in tab 7, page 41, defines a wharf as a wharf, pier, sorry, key, pier, jetty, or 
or other place at which seagoing ships, uh, sorry, seagoing ships can ship or unship goods or embark or disembark passengers. Um, and in our submission, when one looks at that, uh, the reference uh, uh, to other places at which seagoing ships can do various things uh, only shows that wharf itself also has a broad definition. Well, it might just show that, like dock in the legislation to which we're concerned, they were using the word wharf to mean something it didn't usually mean. My Lord, uh, that's, that's an alternative view. As, as I submitted your <laughs> Lordship, uh, uh, there is a broader definition for which we contend. Which brings me then uh, briefly on to the question of whether uh, actually what we have in this case uh, should uh, and does fall within the definition of dock more broadly. And of course, if, if your Lordships were with us on that, then it wouldn't be necessary to look at the sub, um, sub uh, clause uh, section 191. Sub uh, section 9. Um, the judge found uh, that uh, what he had before him didn't fall within the definition of dock, uh, and as my Lord, uh, sorry, as my friend, learned friends indicated, he did so on the basis of the Oxford English uh, Dictionary definition uh, of a dock as an artificial basin built round with masonry and fitted with floodgates into which ships are received for the purposes of loading or unloading for repair, and also. Uh, Mr. Justice Wilmer's observation in the humorist uh, that it's an enclosed space with gates to allow the admission and retention of uh, water. And that was, that's perhaps more significant than a dictionary definition because it's made by a very experienced admiralty judge by reference to this particular legislation. My, my Lord, it is. Um, in, in our submission, although that is certainly uh, uh, one sense in which the term dock can be used. In our submission, there is a, a broader and perhaps less technical, albeit no less accurate sense for the term dock. And indeed, in our submission, the, the, the confining feature, which seems to be that it requires gates, is one which in our submission is, is open to, to question. Of course, his lordship's judgment um, didn't go on appeal as far as we're aware because he found it was a landing place in any event. So there was no there was no particular issue. But if one looks at, for instance, St Catherine's Dock, if you took away the the gates, the tidal gates, uh, in our submission, it would still be a dock within the normal meaning of those terms. And if St Catherine's Dock in that form is a dock, then in our submission, there's no uh, real distinction between that and Hollyhead Marina. Uh, uh, it's not clear, but it does seem to be that the the, the feature which confines it in, in those two definitions is the presence of some form of gates, and if that is it, in our submission that is uh, to narrow the definition too far. Indeed, it, it's fair to say, my, my Lord, that before Mr Justice Tier, um, the full definition in the OED wasn't, I understand, available. And if I could ask the court briefly to turn to page 337 the authorities I'm just um, Googled St Catherine's Dock since I'm obviously not as familiar with it as everybody else in the court um, and it seems to be some ca called St Catherine's Docks Marina <laughs> it, 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 well, I don't think there's anything commercial about it these days um. anyway there we are it's, uh, I mean it's an inland stretch without gates right but it was called St Catherine's Dock historically. Well, I believe uh, it does have gates, actually. I'm pretty I confident. Think still gates. It does, yeah, yes. I think there are still gates. Still, still gates. gates. Yeah. Well, well, since they had a hydraulic problem with, I think, the bridge over the lock or over the car, yeah. not the other day, but there's certainly yeah. some structure that can be drained. Well, apparently, people, it's quite a popular visitor centre. Well, that probably takes you outside the definition of it. <laughs> right. Judges are inappropriate for judges to uh, do their own research. Well, not, 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 not at all. There's a very good curry house on the dock as well, which may be a good place to do some further research. Um, <coughs> my Lords, I was just taking briefly to uh, a, a wider definition of, of dock, which appears at 337 of the authorities' bundle. Uh, and you'll see some uh, heading draft additions usually in singular, a wharf or pier, uh, a key uh, originally in the US. Uh, 
and various examples are given there. Uh, and in our submission, uh, that is in perfectly uh, usable and accurate terms, a description of what is uh, a dock. It is broader than uh, the uh, definition adopted by Mr Justice here. And indeed, my lords, with us, a dock is what the British call a wharf in the New York Times. My lord, I I exactly. Uh, 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 I mean, this, all, this is all not really going anywhere, is it? Well, my lord, if you're obviously with me on the other elements, then, then it isn't. This is simply... But I mean, if you were not, if we were not with you, this last point is unlikely to take you home, I would say. Well, my lord, let, let, let me take you to one more, more document to see if that changes your lordship's view. Okay. Um, supplementary bundle, page 52... I hope you'll have a photograph, it may be on its side, but your, your Lordship will see on the right-hand side of the photograph something that's labelled as fish dock. Yes. Uh, and that is simply uh, a pier, a wharf, uh, and it's the old uh, Hollyhead fish dock. In our submission, that, that indicates and supports that the wider use of the term dock doesn't require something that's enclosed with gates. Well, that fish dock is enclosed, although it's not got gates. Oh, uh, and if you look at that, it's, it's conceptually no different to the marina. The marina is enclosed to some extent by, by, by the breakwater and the pier, um, or the aluminium jetty, and the fish dock is, is conceptually no different. So in our submission, the term dock uh, more broadly would, would be apt to this to describe the marina. I mean, what is that fish dock? Is it a place where fishing boats land their fish? And so it's the old fish dock, so it's where they used to. <coughs> and so it's no longer in, in use. It's the old fish dock. So where the fishing boats used to come in and dock and unload their catch. My Lord... Finally, on this point, and I said at the, the risk of trespassing on your Lordship's patience, we, we do rely on uh, the decision of the court in Environment Agency versus Barras, which is at tab 28 of the authorities' bundle. In an entirely different context. My Lord, it is an entirely different context. Um, however, what I would draw your Lordship's attention to is how uh, the court dealt with uh, the concept of DOC uh, uh, at the end of, or towards the end of the judgment in paragraph 34, page 312. Through its process of reasoning, the court reached the positions where it found that uh, the term dock fell within uh, the wider term works, which constitutes part of, or might constitute part of the pen. Uh, and the issue that it had to decide was whether a marina then fell within the meaning of the term dock. Uh, as and it's an American definition he's using. It is, it is, uh, my lord, the, the definition um, that uh, I've just taken you to. Um, and it, it, it is originally US, um, but it then traces out, and your lordship will see, for instance, in the extract, marina is a little dock for pleasure craft. But what I draw your uh, lordship's attention to is that what the court found is that thus defined the marina fits comfortably within the concept of depth dock in section 4 of the 1932 Act. And we do accept it's a different, uh, it's a different act. However, in our submission, in the context of the broad definition of dock in the uh, Merchant Shipping Act, there's no reason why your lordship shouldn't be guided by that. There's no reason to to believe that certainly the definition in the Merchant Shipping Act was intended to be any narrower than that. It might well have been broader. 
certainly in our submission, it, it wouldn't be narrower. So, my, my lords, in summary, therefore, we do submit that the, the judge uh, could and should have perhaps been a bit bolder in his approach to, to the language of the statute. We accept that this may or may not uh, make any difference to the outcome of the appeal, but since it's before your lordships, we think it's appropriate to consider all the different aspects of the wording uh, that is contained within the statute. So, my lords, that, 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 those are our submissions on, on the wording of the Act. Very briefly, my lords, in terms of the uh, appellant's attempts to, to impose a restriction or a limitation or to read them into uh, the terms of the Act, I think I've covered to some extent uh, what uh, I need to say. In our submission, the judge was, was right as a matter of approach to look first at the language, see what the ordinary and natural meaning was, and then to look at whether there was any reason to restrict <coughs> or, or to limit the scope of the wording used. That's the approach that the judge took, and we submit he was absolutely right to do so. Uh, in terms of my learned friend's uh, case, as I said, he doesn't suggest the judge was wrong to accept the various definitions, but he says they should be read down in some way. In other words, the act applies only or should be read as applying only to some sort of landing places, some sorts of jetties, and some sorts of stages. Uh, as I've already submitted your lordship, precisely which characteristics of a marina are, are said to have that consequence, or why, remains elusive even now. Certainly in the skeleton argument of grounds of appeal, it was suggested that the fact they were floating structures was relevant. That seems no longer to be pursued. Um, well, again, I haven't got from... Mr. Cooper, that anything is not pursued. Well, my, my lord, so, so be it. Um, my lord, on, on the floating structures uh, issue, uh, my lord, I, I don't wish to detain your lordship's inaugural submission, but we've set out uh, in our skeleton argument, paragraphs 44 and following, a whole series of cases where floating structures have been found to be landing places, stages, etc., etc., etc. I, I don't think I need to go through those, but they all um, make it very clear that the fact that something floats makes makes no difference. The second point appears to be this distinction between leisure uh, and commercial use, and the third is uh, the point we've already addressed, is whether uh, the fact they're used for mooring somehow um, uh, renders them something different from that within the Act. As I said, I've already dealt with that, so I, I, I won't go over it again. Uh, and on that uh, analysis, therefore, the, the only issue I think which I need to address your lordships, and we'll do so briefly, is this notion that somehow uh, the Act is limited to commercial um, um, docks, to uh, commercial shipping, uh, and so forth. Now, as I said to your lordship when I, when I opened, um, even that exception or limitation is still ill-defined. Um, it, it's not clear, for instance, whether my learned friend uh, accepts it. Is sorry, a marina, for instance, or a dock which has some uh, leisure use or has some commercial use is... is but I mean, it's, it, as I think I've already said today, it's, it's absolutely obvious that piers and jetties are commonly used for leisure activities and leisure boats, and that's what they're for, oh. in large measure. So the idea that these definitions exclude, there would have to be some other reason for excluding oh. them, apart from what the words meant. Well, my lord, uh, 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 and that's precisely our, our, our submission, and we don't have an explanation of the legal analysis which leads to that result either. But we're told there was a, a purpose behind the original right to limit that is uh, to, to, to foster international trade, but it's not... So that may well be, but it, it doesn't make it an exclusive purpose. Well, precisely. And I mean, I, one might argue that there was no such thing as leisure shipping in 1900, but that's simply wrong. Well, correct. Uh, and by that stage, as your lordship will be aware, it was already clear that the right to limit extended to the leisure yachts. And the simple point in our submission is when one looks at the reciprocal nature of the deal that was done, as his lordship explains in the judgment, it, it would be contrary to that purpose, not uh, for the section two right to limit not also to extend uh, to, to 
pleasure crop. It simply makes no sense to introduce an act which is, as his lordship explains, a deal between the two interest groups, so ship owners on one side and dock owners on the other side, <coughs> to introduce a reciprocal right and for it not to be genuinely reciprocal. What, what's, the, what's the correct approach for the court to take? If, uh, I'm not saying we do, but if, if we were to take the view that the original act, the 1900 act, was enacted with a view at that time to um, protecting merchant shipping and developing merchant shipping. And there's never been a decision which says it's exclusively that. In fact, as far as I'm aware, there's never been a decision on it one way or the other. And you come to the 1995 Act, and it's simply reenacted in the same terms, but in a different social context, because we know that leisure boating has become much more popular. Can we really deduce anything from what people may have thought, have been thinking about in 1900, <coughs> if we take the view that the words are broad enough to cover leisure use? My Lord, in our submission, not. What we do submit is relevant, is that in 1900, because of the Saturnita, which was pre-1900, it would have been understood that the limitation, the right to limit, uh, did apply to leisure vessels. That that is part of. I understand that, but I'm, I'm the, the contrary argument, which we were listening to this morning, yeah. was we should, we should, uh, as I understood the submission, was that we should assume that the 1995 reenactment in the same terms means that the same thought process that informed the original 1900 Act applied to what the, the reenactment. And at the moment, I'm not sure of a principled basis for, for reaching that view in the absence of an authority which says before 1995, it, it, it's commercial use only. My Lord, I, I, we've certainly adopted the approach that the, the meaning of the, the 1995 Act was, was a consolidation act in large part. Um, in, in our submission, the meaning would be the same in the 1900 Act as the 1995 Act. Indeed, one of the points we make is that it, it would be odd if, by adopting the same wording, it was found that the position had changed. Uh, well, I mean, uh, statutes actually can change their meanings. Mm. See Lord Sale's recent judgment in a case that I, I'm afraid I've forgotten the name of, and the case uh, in which um, uh, I sat recently in the Court of Appeal. Say, Relating to tax matters, I think it involved the sky or uh, the time, I think. Or anyway, it doesn't matter, but it was a VAT case. But I mean, they can, statutes can change their meanings in certain circumstances when technology, for example, changes things. But um, it's very circumscribed and it all depends what Parliament, it all depends on what Parliament is to be taken to have meant by the term, um, bearing in mind not only what the position was at the time of enactment, but also what it might have thought about the future. So it's complicated, well, but this is just not that case. Well, well that, that was going to be my submission. I don't think technology has changed sufficiently to, to, to persuade you to change the meaning of the act. No, I'd love it if it did, but... Uh, okay. no. Sorry, red herring. I, well, I my lord, not at all. I, I think your lordship's point does lead me, ha however, to, to, to what was my next submission, is that whether it's in 1900 or 1995, what is relevant is that we know that parliamentary draftsmen were able to and did exclude leisure yachts when they intended to do so. Yeah. And your lordships will see in, I think it's paragraph 62 of our skeleton argument, that we, we set out a number of occasions on which they have, have done so. But they stre stretch back to an act of 1844. They're in the bundle. I'm, I'm not going to take your lordships uh, to them unless you want to. But the short point is that uh, the parliamentary draftsmen have, uh, have specifically excluded pleasure yachts when they want to. Uh, and importantly, they did so in the 1995 Act. So this very Act. Your, your, your Lordships will see reference uh, in the third subparagraph 
the Schedule 3 Paragraph 1, which has actually now been uh, repealed. Uh, but that, just for your note, can be found at tab 9, page 48 of the bundle. This is to do with uh, load lines. Uh, and we can see in Schedule 3, the schedule applies to all ships except number, number C uh, pleasure yachts. So in this very statute, uh, which you're uh, asked to construe, the draftsman excluded pleasure yachts when, when they wanted to, uh, and by dint of reasoning in our submission, uh, not having done so in section and one, fishing one, vessels, so there's all sorts of possible um, exclusions. Indeed. Indeed. Um, yes. Uh, so your, your lordships have, have, have my point. Um, <coughs> Mullah, I... I um, I'm conscious of the time. Uh, I think I have dealt with uh, the other points that my learned friend has raised. Um, as I said to you earlier, at the forefront of his argument, certainly as I'd read his skeleton, was this notion that all the structures in section 191, uh, subsection 9, were only for use in commercial, or only used in commercial uses. That's simply not right as a matter of language. Uh, and as the springboard for that uh, distinction, it, it seems to us to be a, uh, a bad one. Um, Since then, you might say the argument has morphed a little. My, my lord, it, it has, and, uh, and I've already addressed with what it appears to have morphed to, which is notion that berthing or mooring the vessel somehow uh, takes those structures outside the meaning of the act. And that's in our submission is plainly not the case. Yes. So, my lord, I think I've covered the ground that I need to cover with your lordships, unless there are any other points that you would like me to address um, but those are, are our submissions Thank you very much uh, Mr Thomas Mr Cooper My Lord, thank you I'll endeavour not to go back over the points that my learned friend has made which I've already addressed this morning um, but, but there are one or two I do need to come back and, uh, and deal with So, uh, if I can in a sense take it by, in reverse order in the hope that by doing so I deal with things more fluently just to pick up the point you were making earlier, my lord, about whether or not you read the 1995 Act in terms in in you know in, as having a meaning that is broader than the original 1900, I've, without trammelling into the, the principles that might apply as to when you can generally read statutes that way, in relation to the 1995 Act, you can accept that that, that wasn't the intention behind the reintroduction of the old of the same definition as, as in the 1900 Act because the 1995 Act, in essence, also gives effect to the right to limit under the 1976 Convention. And as the judge recognised in his judgment, uh, the purpose of limitation within the 1976 Convention was the promotion of international carriage of goods by sea, uh, goods and passengers by sea. So again, it has that same commercial context or flavour. And, and that really brings me on to um, this point that my lady friend has repeated, which is that our case is that somehow, unless a structure is used for a commercial purpose, it can't fall within Section 1 and 2 of the 1900 Act or Section 191. Uh, and that's not been our submission. It wasn't our submission in our skeleton. It, ha it wasn't our submission, my submission this morning. Our point is this. We accept that there is a wide definition to be given to dock. We have to in light of the but that wide definition of dock do, does not mean that you enter into a free-for-all of dictionary definitions or colloquial, colloquial usages of terms. And just because colloquially or in an American dictionary somewhere a term is defined as a, uh, is referred to as a dock or a, a marina is referred to as a dock or a wharf or whatever it may be, you then assume that it is a dock for the purposes of section 191. You have to ask yourself, is this a structure which Parliament intended by the definition in section 1919 should be entitled to the reciprocal right to limit that is granted originally by section 1 of the 1900 Act and then subsequently in the 1995 Act? 
And it is, in a sense, a break on the attempt by my learned friend to suggest that simply because, colloquially, one can refer to a structure as a landing stage, or a stage, or a ponton, or as a jetty, it falls within the right to limit under section 191. And we say that is not correct. And, and, and the genesis of the right to limit in section 2 and, and, and indeed in section 1 of the 1900 Act, as that was carried over to 1995, provides a means of, as it were, stress testing whether or not in any particular circumstance it is right to describe the structure in question, be it a landing place, a jetty, whatever it, whatever the term may be. And it's I, with I, that. This isn't an unfair question, but um, just to see where you're going, are you able to encapsulate your case by completing the sentence which begins, the marina is not within the definition of a dock because? Because as a structure, it does it is not a dock or basin, as per the humorist nor as a structure does it fall with any of any, within any of the other limbs of uh, the definition in section 191. Thank you. Um, and, and, and my lord, we looked very briefly at Barras with my learned friend and the definition that he took you to, um, originally taken from the United States on page 313 in the bundle. Um, I make only a very quick point on that definition, uh, which is that when you read it through carefully, it refers to the marinas in question as being a basin, or uh, indeed a well-dammed basin, which is very clearly not what the marina was in this case. Um, and again, my lord, it, uh, to take your St. Catherine's example, the difference between St. Catherine's dock um, when you have an opportunity to go and look at it. Is, is my Lord? St. Catherine's Dock, as a matter of interest, just one square dock? It, it is a, I, I, don't know if it's, I think it's more oval or, or is round. Is it a series? It, of them? No, it is a single, as, I, as far as I'm aware, it's a single dock in a basin off the, off, uh, entered through a cut off the Thames. And as far as I'm aware, that cut is, is locked. But I, I wouldn't the, want to swear uh, to a, that without there's a bridge. There's a bridge over it which, which swings. Yes, which, as I say, was broken the other day. Because <laughs> a friend of mine fell into the hydraulic oil floating on the water. Um, but, 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 my lord, the, the, the difference between that kind of structure, a basin that encapsulates a marina, the same as, uh, as in Barras, the, the basin that is off the Thames in the non-tidal stretch up at Penton Hook, is a very different structure to the structure that we're dealing here with here, which is a, simply a series of floating pontoons open to the weather. That is not a dock within the context, in the same way that St. Catherine's or, or, Bar or, or the docks in Barras were. The marina yes, well, speaking only for myself, you're pushing it an open door. That this, this is not a dock within the, uh, uh, a dock per se, as opposed to a dock within one of the other definitions. Um, my lord, I, I won't push any further, but I will just move on. Um, and, An open gate, I should say. <laughs> Hopefully working more effectively. A tidal gate, yes, my lord. Correct. My lord, I, I have taken you through the definitions. Um, at a point on floating, which my learned friend does. Yes. It, it, it is really again this. It is part of testing. It's not a. We don't say absolutely because a structure is floating. It can't be within the scope of the definition. But we do say that when you come to look sensibly at whether or not it is a structure that falls within the definition, it is one of the questions to ask whether or not that structure properly falls within the definition of dock under the Act. It's mm. tethered It's tethered to the base, to the floor, isn't it? This particular dock is tethered to the seabed so by anchors connected. Yes, or anchored, rather than being built on what I might call piers or piles or whatever anybody else has thought. Yeah. It is, it is tethered to the, to the bed of the water. Yes. Uh, 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 my Lord, just picking out while we're talking about 
tethered to the water, but picking up my own friend's comments on the definition of peer and his reference to what is open in the context of a peer. He took you to the definition that referred to the fact that in the, the Oxford, uh, Oxford English Dictionary it refers to the, po the potential of the peer being open underneath. Now, certainly my understanding of that is not a reference to the fact that there's water underneath, but it is the fact that the peer, a bit like South End or Brighton, sits on piles above the water. Uh, my lord, my learned friend didn't take you in detail through the various authorities that he's referred to in terms of floating structures. I think all I really need to do, rather than go through each of those authorities in time, which I don't think would be a fruitful exercise in turn, is, is point out, as I did in before lunch, that each of those authorities is not dealing with the question that is before you. It is not dealing with the question of whether or not particular structures um, are or are not. Uh, docks within the meaning of section 191. And I hesitate to say it, but if one looks at, for example, the Cardiff rating case in which um, Lord, Justice, Lord Justice Denning, as he then was, uses a floating pontoon as, a, as an example for determining whether or not a tilting furnace is a movable structure, um, th that is not going to answer the question that is before you. No, it sounds like a great case, though. It sounds like a <laughs> Well, my lord, maybe. Um, so, we say you've got the cases that deal with the definition, the, the few cases that there are, um, and, and those are the ones to guide you. I, I would, insofar as my learned friend refers to Mason and Uxbridge Boat Centre, which you have in the bundle of authorities at tab 24, um, just make these comments. It's, it's a case concerning a repair yard. Uh, at which got repair, very poor repairs were done to a boat uh, 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 over a very lengthy period of time and the owner eventually sued for breach of contract and negligence. Um, and it was held that the, the premises at which the repairs were done was a dock for the purposes of the uh, 1900 Act and therefore the, the, the dock, the, the repair yard could limit their liability. Um, the reason, of course, in, in that the, the yard in those in those circumstances could limit their liability, not just because it fell within the definition, but also because it was conceded in that case by the council for the, the boat owner. And that so it was the case a where the repairs were carried out was conceded to be a dock. Yes, my lord. So again, it doesn't really assist in terms of answering the questions that are before you. My lord, I, it was suggested at some point, I think, by my learned friend, that I have a bridge point. I don't have a bridge point. Um, I, I was simply making, describing the marina to your lordships in, uh, before lunch and, and explaining how the bridge led on to the, on to the pontoons. My learned friend, I mean, you, you've, you've answered my lord's unfair question. Um, can you answer mine? I will try. <laughs> um, which is, it's always unfair to ask an advocate this, but I think it, the, the allegation that I made against you whilst Mr. Thomas was making his submissions, that your case had morphed, um, may have been a little unfair, but it's also slightly true. What is your best argument for um, suggesting that none of these terms um, really describe the marina, um, bearing in mind that we're now very familiar with the way the marina, what it is, that it's a collection of pontoons with a bridge connecting it to the land. Why, why do you say that the definition, which is, you accept, very wide, um, has to be restricted, particularly when there are words like landing places and stages and um, jetties, which are quite loose. Oh, my lord, we say, quite simply, because that's not what this structure was. And that in order to describe any the marina as a whole, or any element of it as a landing place, as a jetty or a pier, 
you either have to break down its constituent elements to find the individual gears of guess, which we would say is an artificial process that is not what is encompassed within the definition of the act. Or you have to look at the structure as a whole and, and give it a meaning which it isn't really a, 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 a definition which it really isn't intended to bear. And, and we and come and back to. Sorry, I interrupt you. I'll just finish my sentence if I may. We come back to the, the fact that his lordship, <coughs> Justice Tier, was quite right in the beginning of his reasoning to say this is not a dock within the. the accepted definition of that word, what the definition found in the humorous. And really, that is where he should have stopped. I mean, would it be fair to say that what you're really concentrating on is that this is genuinely a marina, and uh, marinas, as they're understood, is a, an entire structure for the housing of small boats. And um, that's not something that was, whilst it can be characterized you would say, as um, <clears throat> in, in one sense, as a landing place, because people land there, and you have to accept that. That's not what it really, as a whole, is, which is why, and, and you say the key to, to the demise of the judge's judgment is that he had to break it down into pontoons in order to find it to be those things. And so you say, keep your eye on the whole thing, and the whole thing is something that is not really clearly within any of those definitions. Is that, that is it. one it Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I'm trying to, I'm struggling for it, because uh, I think, but I, I think that's a fair way of putting your argument, and then you can add to it the commercial aspect, it's not really about, it's really about commercial structures, and this is really a leisure structure in toto, as we see from the yeah. pictures. And um, it, it's um, it, it's a birthing place. It's not really a landing place, and so on. And then you, but they're all really add-ons to the to this one point about it being a marina, which is something that is just not envisaged by any of those words. Really, it's stretching the words. But it's a structure that's not within those definitions. Yes, that's and I I I make that slight distinction because I did accept at the beginning of my. Speech when you look at cases like Barrett's or indeed St. Catherine's Dock, it may be that alternative structures that carry on business as a definition, as a business, sort of carry on business as a marina, can fall within the definition because of the, the makeup of the structure. But that is not this dock, this marina. I mean, speaking for myself, I find the cases, with the possible exception of the humanist, slightly unhelpful uh, because they're, they're not really looking at the same problem we're looking at. But um, uh, it's very helpful that you've confirmed your your, your uh, case. I, I have, my lord, you, you had a well. Question. I have what I think has now become a supplementary. <laughs> well, my lord, what part, if any, in your argument is played by the submission you made this morning on a number of occasions? This isn't within section one nine one nine because this is a place where yachts berth. Oh, my lord, that, that does play into how we say you look at the structure as a whole, uh, and, and you can't, and that's why we say it is artificial to then try and break down the structure as a whole into constituent elements to say, well, this part of it is a landing place, or this part of it is a pier or a jet. Uh, and my lord, I go back to what I said by way of introduction, which is that when you look at how the claim to limit was originally and the way the marina was described for the purposes of that claim to limit, it was described as a place where yachts birth. And, and, and all the evidence that was then advanced was in support of the position that the marina was a place where vessels birth. And in a sense, although I'm criticised in another context for not having taken a pleading point, the way that the claimant's case or the respondent's case developed before the judge and has developed before this court is a morphing or a metamorphosis of the way that their case was originally put. 
Um, and, and it's notable that when one looks back at the judgments of his lordship, he does say in the judgment that the way the case was primarily put by the claimants in their, the respondent in their skeleton was with, on the basis of, or was on the basis of the marina as a dock or basin. And it was only in the context of the oral submissions that the case came primarily to be put on the basis that the pontoons were keys, jetties, wharfs, whatever it may be. So my Lord, have I answered your question? You have. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my Lord, just a, just a point on reci reciprocity. Um, I made the point at the beginning, but I think in light of some of my own friends' submissions, it, 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 it bears emphasising again. Um, we quite accept that when the Section 2 of the Merchant Shipping Act of the, of the 19, Act of 1900 was introduced, it was introduced in a way to give reciprocity in comparison to the rights introduced by Section 1. But we say that reciprocity has its limits because reciprocity only applies in relation to those structures that Parliament considered fell within the definition of the DOC a dock, either in section 2 subject to the port, or in section 1919. It is not, a, it is not on, of itself a reason or, or a basis for giving any wider or expanded definition to the meaning of the word dock, or, or to take with it that there should be some general right to limit granted to marinas, irrespective of the nature of the structures involved. Uh, my Lord, on the multiple um, funds point, I think I dealt this morning with the majority of the arguments that my learned friend advanced. Just if I may pick up, um, looking at his point on section um, 191.9, and it's at uh, page 44 in the bundle. He makes the point that we have the reference to the word dock in the singular means, uh, and then there is a reference to landing places in the plural. But as I think my, learned, my, my Lord Mayles commented, Sir Justice, Lord Justice Mayles commented this morning, all of the definitions all of the subsequent constituents of the dock um, are in the plural. And, and, I and I would, our submission would be you can't take from that use of the plural that it's intended to suggest that there can only ever be one fund. All it is simply saying is that any dock or basin can be a dock, uh, a cut, or uh, you know, it, the, the use of the plural is not intended to have a limiting factor. Yeah, but it would make a bit of a nonsense of it if you had 50 pontoons and there were therefore 50 limits of liability in this marina. Well, I mean, maybe you say, well, that's the reason why a marina is not included, because it is a collection of 50 pontoons. Well, it's one reason why a marina might not be included, or it may be, my lord, that that is a point at which one has to say, well, one has to look at the, the suggestion that the marina is comprised of a number of landing places and, and work out what structures it was that his lordship below had in mind as being the landing place. Because if you, for example, take it as being the breakwater is one and the pontoons are another, each ponto each finger or, or long, e e each of the pontoons, A, B, A through to F, is individually a separate landing See, I think I think the problem you've got is the one that my Lord put to you uh, this morning, which is that I don't think the judge was saying it is a number of landing I think the judge was saying it is a landing place made up of a lot of pon pontoons. Well, c can I on that point, my lord, because that was a point I was going to come to. Just take to paragraph 39 in the judgment. Yes. I mean, construing judgments as deeds is not helpful. Uh, I, I, I was rather hoping that, that, that if one looks at paragraph 39, 
the language of the paragraph stand, speaks for itself. Well, that is what he held. But, but all he these reasons, the pontoons which make up the marina. So uh, it, it could be said that that means that oh, I see our landing places. Yeah. I, I mean, this is a this is a this is a moment in time when looking at the fact that he speaks of the the pontoons plural being landing places plural indicates that he wasn't referring to the marina as a landing he place was, as answering the question is whether the marina is within the ordinary meaning of landing place jetty or stage but he has done so but not by saying that the marina is a landing place but by saying that the, the pontoons are landing places it may depend on your perspective I mean, if you're out in the Irish Sea somewhere and you um, crew asks the skipper, where should we land tonight? Uh, the answer might be Hollywood Marina would be a good landing place. But if you're coming through the breakwater, and, you, and you're a visitor, and you say, well, shall we land at that pontoon or that pontoon, you might view them differently. But it's hard to think that that's going to um, affect the question we're dealing with. No, my lord. And I think, in a sense, that goes back to the way I put my... Or, his lordship very kindly, very eloquently put our case <laughs> and asked me if that represented what we were saying. And that's where you come back to look at the marina as a structure as a whole. is not a landing place within the, within the meaning of the act. However, it might be described by someone with more or less um, sailing or seagoing knowledge when they're on their way in through the Irish Sea. Um, but, but what you then have to look at is what the judge did. And he, he, he did not find that structure as a whole constituted a landing place he broke it down yeah uh, my lord, I think you have the point and, and let's go excuse me my, my lord can I to remind my lord that if, if we are looking for statutory definition, going back to the question of definition, that you can see how marina was dealt with in the Capital Allowances Act and, and the, the, the distinction that was then drawn when you looked at how marina was referred to, that there was in the definition an express reference uh, to the place where uh, yachts and boats are kept, which does illustrate um, and, and that, that same distinction didn't then carry on into the definition of dock later on in the same act, uh, where simply they referred to loading and unloading of goods or embarkation and disembarkation of passengers. Um, my learned friend made a point about the distinction, that the suggestion that our case, sorry, our arguments would, would play, make a significant difference between the position of the owner of a canal uh, and the owner of a dock. Uh, I, I, I don't accept that that's the case, but, but of course the distinction which is very clear from the set, from the wording of section section 1.191 is that you have a definition of dock within that section there is no definition of canal so you're not grappling with the same types of questions that arise in relation to a canal owner there's no question of is it a pier or a wall it is simply a canal and that gives rise to the right to limit if you are the owner of that uh, and then finally, my lord, um, a point was made at the very beginning of my learned friend's submission about um, whether or not our point on multiple funds was open to us because it wasn't pleaded. Uh, my lord, I'm not sure that that takes us very far in, in the sense that the arguments have been fully ventilated before yourselves. Uh, and in, ma in many respects, one of the reasons why the point may not was not pleaded as such in the defence was because that's not how the claimant put its case in their claim form or in their declaration. But do you accept it wasn't taken below either? Well, it wasn't, my lord, because in a sense it arises out of the way in which his lordship 
having rejected the argument that the marina was a dock or You didn't place. need, you didn't, sorry, 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 I've interrupted you again, but you didn't need the argument to develop for this point to be taken in your pleading. You could easily have said in your, if, it's, if there's any substance in the point, you could easily have said multiple, each pontoon is to be regarded as, if we're wrong, each pontoon is to be regarded as, as a... Well, my Lord, that's why I, I, I started this line of argument by saying when you look at the declaration, because there isn't a particulars of claim or statement of claim in the ordinary way to which we would plead our defence, that we plead in a sense to the declaration, and this point is not taken in that declaration. So it simply talks about the marina as, as a marina. It doesn't then say, but if we're wrong about that, each of the constituent elements, each pontoon or collection of pontoons is, is, is a dock, uh, brings us within the dock. So... Well, it wouldn't say that, would it? Because that's, that's, that's fatal to their case. Uh, well, but, but that's my point. That's my answer to why it wasn't taken in the amended... In, in but your better, your better answer is it wasn't taken because it became centre stage when the judge put, as he did, pontoon... This is a collection of pontoons. Yes. And, you know, if, if you were right about that and that wasn't argued before and you were right about that making it a multiple limits of liability, then... Um, but I think we're getting away from the main point, to be honest. My Lord, yeah. Um, my Lord, we, unless there's any... To decide whether this is a dock within section 119. That, that is, of course, the main point, my Lord. Um, and I think so. Uh, <laughs> on that, I think I've made my submissions. Um, if there's have. anything further I can assist you with... Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Cooper, and thank you, Mr. Thomas, and thanks to your, both your juniors and your instructing sisters for a marvellous cameo case, really. We'll take time to consider our judgments and hand them down in due course in the usual way. And uh, will you please agree um, the costs and the consequential order? And if you can't agree, then you'll deal with all those matters, as you know in writing, and if you can't agree the order in which you deal with them in writing, which I think is vanishingly unlikely, we will tell you how to do it. <laughs> thank, thank you very you much, Lord. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you.